the disciples were with Jesus. And the disciples early on in Jesus' life was ready for a revolution. They were wanting Jesus to take over the world. But starting about Matthew chapter 13, Jesus was starting to say, these guys are not going to follow me. These guys are going to reject me. And these disciples were saying, when is the kingdom coming? When is the revolution going to take place? And Jesus said, I'm not here for a revolution. Everything that I do has to be a choice by man or woman. So he starts in Matthew chapter 13, and he starts giving some parables. Jesus talks in parables. He talks in stories. And, and the disciples were wondering, what, what, what are you talking about? And he was one to talk about, everybody has a choice, and not everybody that's going to hear me, they're going to follow me. Some people will reject me. Some people will ridicule me. Some people may understand for a while, but because of circumstances, they're going to say, it is not worth it. So they walk away. And then the second parable in, in Matthew chapter 13, he talks about that he's going out and sowing his seed. But in the midst of sowing the seed, the enemy comes and, and plants tares in the midst of the wheat. And the disciples said, should we go in and should we take out the tares or should we take out the, 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 the bad and Jesus said, no, in taking out the tares in the midst of the wheat, you may hurt some wheat, so no. Let us wait for the harvest time, and at the harvest time, we'll be able to separate the tares from the wheat, and we'll burn the tares, but the wheat will go into the barn. And he comes into this third parable. This third parable of Matthew chapter 13 is so small, but it's so awesome. Let's look at what it says in 31 and 32. It says this, another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but it is grown, it is greater than all the herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air came to nest in its branches. A lot of times when Jesus is giving parables, he talks about gardening tools, he talks about seeds, he talks about watering the seeds and how the seeds will grow up. And there's no difference here because in, in the time and the place of Jesus, they would understand the gardening aspect. They didn't have a Dylan's grocery store. They planted what they ate. They worked for what they had. So these men would understand the gardening aspect or the, or the planting aspect of the seed. And they would understand when you look at a mustard seed, the mustard seed is one of the smallest seeds of all. And you look at this little mustard seed, it's like a really dinky little seed. In other words, let's watch how small this seed would be on this video. the size of a mustard seed. In parallel, sometimes in our life, when we look at the seed that God has put upon my life, my gifts and my talents and the abilities that I have to plant the seed that God has given to me into the ground or into someone's life. Whenever we plant the seed of ministry, or the seed of life, when somebody's heart is, say, 
I'm so insignificant. There's nothing that God can do through me. I've done too much. I've gone too far. What could God ever do? But there's nothing in the Bible that's ever been great for God that didn't start small. We look at Jesus, born of a virgin in a manger, had absolutely nothing to his own. Started with the worst of times, in the worst of circumstances, in the worst of places, became up and had a, a carpenter as a dad and learned the carpentry field, lived 33 years in nowhere, had 13 to 12 men that were really insignificant men that couldn't grow up to do anything, but God called the insignificant and he did something great with them. You look at any time God used anyone, he used somebody that was insignificant and he empowered them and he brought that seed to a point where God could use it. And the mustard seed, a smallest seed in the garden, when it is planted, it will be grown up to a tree. Wow, how could a small little seed grow up to a tree? And so often we think about our seed, that we would have our ministry, that we would plant our opportunity that we could impact somebody's life. We would say, it wouldn't be worth anything. And you know what? You are absolutely right. Your life without God would almost be nothing. But let me tell you something. When God shows up in faith and you plant your life, your seed, your ministry in the ground and God allows that to grow, it becomes everything. When God unexpectedly shows up in your life, the seed, the ministry, the opportunity that you plant. You may see, I have a bush, but God sees a tree. I see what I want. I want mustard from my mustard tree. And God says, I don't care about the mustard on the tree. I have something bigger, something greater, something more impactful than just the bush. I have something generational. I have something that's going to impact many people, not just mustard from a tree, I have a bigger plan. And in this peril, parable, he says, the tree grows up and the trees grow up between seven to eight foot tall. Sometimes they grow up to 12 to 15 foot tall. And in the tree, they have branches. And what lies upon those branches? And the birds will come in and land upon those branches. So there's times in our mustard seed parable that we had a plan for our life, for our seed, for our ministry, for our seed of faith. And we said, I'm gonna give it to God. And God says, I want you to take whatever you have for me, whatever seed that you have, whatever ministry that you have, whatever resources that you have, I want you to give it to me and I want you to bury that seed. And when that seed is grounded in the, word, grounded in the ground, and the waters come, the roots of that seed will start to go deep to search for water. But then the plant starts to sprout. And the sprouting of that tree or that root starts growing up to search for sunshine. Every time that we plant, every time that we take our ministry, every time that we take our seed, every time that we give opportunity and say, God, here it is. God wants you to give it to him to a point that it's covered. I have given it to God. God has put it into the ground and it is no longer mine. It is God's. And whatever ministry we have, whatever resources we have, whatever children that we have, when we give it over to God, God is going to plant it and God is going to give us the harvest. We may expect one thing. Well, I may plant a seed hoping to get a result. But what God does, he takes what I expect and he does something unexpectedly. He does something far greater than I could ever think, imagine, or even dream of because I am willing to take that seed that I plant and give it to God. And God takes the most simplest of forms, a seed. And he said, it's a seed of faith. It's a seed of our life. It's a seed of ministry. You look at people that have sacrificed their life, sacrificed their ministry, and sacrificed for others. And then you look at something you may not notice until five or 10, 15, 20 years down the road. 
And you get a phone call or you get a letter or you talk to somebody at reunion. And they talk about something that you did or something that you gave or a sacrifice that you made. And when you do that, you can say little as much when God is in it. Little as much. I may have said a prayer. I may have made a phone call. I may have talked to somebody. But God is in the midst of everything that we do. So mustard seed. God's kingdom starts small but grows very large. And he says the kingdom of God is like, is like, starts very small but grows very large. Jesus' disciples. At this time, there was 12, and then down the road, there's 120, and one of them walks away, and, and 120 disciples, you look at that, and you think about what could ever start so small. What, could, what such an insignificant number could grow to this mighty kingdom God work? Do you realize how simple something so insignificant will be? I read this, and I thought it would be interesting. Do you think a single dollar bill could ever amount to much? Maybe you've never heard the story of Atlanta soda fountain where a new tonic syrup was mistakenly mixed up in carbonated water instead of plain water. The result was the drink known as Coca-Cola. Among the people who came was Aza Chandler. Drugstore enjoyed the new taste of the businessman named B.N. Thomas. Thomas thought the product was marketable for home use, while Chandler thought, no way, it's not worth anything. So Chandler sold Thomas the right to sell Coca-Cola by the bottle for a grand total of how much? One dollar. Coca-Cola was bought for a buck. You want, anybody want stock in Coca-Cola right now? Something so insignificant, one dollar grew to such a powerful force that you can go to any country I've been to a lot of countries. I've been to India. I've been to Panama. I've been to Cuba. I've been to India. And guess what? Everybody has Coca-Cola. Everybody has a cell phone in one hand and Coca-Cola in the other. Everybody has it. A Coca-Cola. Something so simple, insignificant, became so great. How do we do this? Seeds of faith have unexpected benefits. Seeds of faith have unexpected benefits. You see all these little seeds, but when you put your faith in your seed, what happens is God does the miraculous. In your power, in your gifts, in our abilities, you're right, nothing. But when we are willing to serve, when we're willing to do uh, the nasty and serve in the nursery. Yeah, <laughs> praise Jesus for that. I love my time in the nursery. But you know what? When you're willing to serve in the nursery, you know what nursery spelled backward is? Repaid. <laughs> um, so you get repaid if you, you, you know, change the diapers, you get all the stuff. But you know what? You get to serve. And you know what? It may nothing be, look what I get to do. I get to serve in a miraculous way. But God doesn't look at what you do. He sees the heart in which you do what you do. Those little babies, they're not going to give you a high five. They're not going to thank you. Mom and dads, they're going to be upset that your baby was crying. There's, there's all kinds of things that's not pleasant to serve in the nursery. But God looks at the heart. Seeds of faith have unexpected benefits. So how does that work? When this seed was planted in the ground, it grew up, and it was seven to eight foot tall. And it started sprouting out to have branches the birds of the air came to rest in the branches of the mustard seed bush that grew up from a seed that a guy planted. Did he plant the seed so the birds can to land on the branches? No. He planted the seed for his own personal use. But because we plant the seed and we have faith that God's going to bless the feed, God's going to take that seed, the ministry, and he's growing, and he is going to be able to use things that you have no intended for, but God can use whatever you plant and give to him. So whatever it is that you have, whether it is your child, whether it is your ministry, whether it is your resources, when we say, I am planting my ministry, my life, my seed, for God. And God unexpectedly 
grows that seed into something that we have no idea what it's going to look like or be like, but it is God's, then God can do whatever he wants with it. We may not know what it's going to look like, but we know it's going to be tended well because God takes care of his. You know, whenever you have a garden, you can't just plant a garden and walk away. I hated my dad sometimes because my dad loved the garden. And I was the little runt of the litter. And guess what that meant? Bruce, before you go to the pool, I need those potatoes. I need those weeds taken out. I need you to till that ground. I need you. I mean, it was like four hours of work in the garden before I could go do anything. I said, Dad, it's just a stinking garden. But you know what? My dad walked into the house and he walked into that garden. If I did not do what I was supposed to do, Bruce Thomas, get in here! He was chapped because that garden needed to be tended to. And any time that we plant something, God is going to tend to that garden. Sometimes it needs to be purged. Sometimes it needs to be grafted. Sometimes it needs to be pulled. Sometimes it needs to be replanted. Sometimes it needs to be weeded. God always does what it takes to do to grow ministry or to make that seed grow. And sometimes God wants us to be involved with that. Seeds of faith have unexpected benefits. Those branches that took care of those birds, they were for a lot of reasons. Sometimes those birds get tired and they just need rest. Sometimes those birds need nutrition, so they bite at the tree to get the nutrition from the tree. There's all kinds of reasons why those birds landed on that bush, but the reason why the man put the seed in the ground was not for the birds to get nutrition and rest. It was that he wanted a mustard bush or a mustard tree. So what are some unexpected blessings? Number one, I believe it's numerical growth. The church started with a few people and has grown into a global family. The Bible says it's like the, the church of God. The mustard seed is like the family of God. It's planted and it grows. And it starts something small, but it grows into something great. And these disciples were saying, how can we, 11 guys, how can we change the world? He said, listen, Everything starts small. If it is worth it, start small and be dedicated, be understanding that it is not about you, it's about me. And when you give me what you have, I can bless what you have and I can give you unexpected blessings in every area of your life. You have to give it to me. Is your child giving you problems? Give him to me. If your finances are in disarray, bury the seed and give it to me. And let God do the unexpected blessing that you can't fathom. But yet when you get done, the unexpected blessing is God's going to show up. And if God shows up in any area of your life, it's better with God than without him. Whenever God shows up, it's supernatural. It's unbelievable. It's powerful. It's it's. It's unexplainable, but it's awesome, but it's scary. What is God going to ask of me next? You know what? God is not going to ask of anything to you next until you first do what he asked to you today. And when God blesses you today, and then he asks you to do something tomorrow, you're trying to find out where can I plant more seeds? Because it's unexpected blessings. It's awesome. It's awesome. It's scary. Let's look at what the disciples did. 120 disciples in the upper room. 120 disciples in the upper room, and they're scared for their life. Jesus was just crucified. And he says, go and preach. And Peter just denied him just a few, year, a few days before. He was afraid for his life. And in Acts chapter 2, out of something small, great things grow when God shows up. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. That day about 3,000 souls were added to them. 
And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrines and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. Their fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all that were believed together and all had things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all, and everyone had need. So continually, daily, with one accord in the temple and the breaking of bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily with those who were being saved. Their biggest fear in Matthew chapter 13 is how. The recommendation in Acts chapter 2 is let me show you how. You just do what I ask you to do. You proclaim the message. You share my faith. You talk about Jesus died on the cross. You think about him resurrected power. You think about you wanting to grow. Plant the seed of faith. When you plant the seed of faith, God does great things, and he does wonderful things. I even think about this church. In 1956, 59 years ago, this little church was started in a garage, and this little church, 56 years ago, had a handful of people. And today, our church has over 1,000 in membership and 600 in attendance. What we have done is we have continued to grow. Are we where we need to be? Absolutely not. But 56 years ago, they planted a seed in the ground and said, South Wichita needs a church that's going to proclaim the message of Jesus Christ to all the generations. That pastor, that group of individuals said, yes, let us sacrifice. They gave their money. They gave their resources. They built 15 different add-ons to this church. Why? It's because they wanted Jesus Christ to be known in South Wichita. They planted the seed of faith and let God do the work. If we are not willing to do that to the next generation, why are we saying thank you to the last generation? The next generation should see our seed of faith. It should see our tree grow up, our branches extended, and the next generation, the birds of the air, will be able to land on our branches. They could take nourishment from our branches, and then we could be unexpected blessed by God when we know that our seed of faith, our seed of ministry, our children, are not only given to God, but blessed by God. Spencer Walker, where are you at? The seed of faith that you planted in your daughter is not for today. You got the privilege of baptizing her today. But the power and the seed of the faith that you implanted in her life is uncomprehendable how that impact upon her life because of your, just, your gift of salvation you've given to her through the word of God. It could be multiple generations down the road. Now, I know that you wanted her to be saved. Every, every adult wants their child to be saved. We have no idea what it looks like. We have no idea the impact of that child that gave their life to Christ will be like 40, 50, 60 years down the road. But we do know that if we don't plant the seed, the next generation will never see Jesus. We have to say, it is on purpose. I'm going to plant the seed of growth. How can we tell if you're growing or not? How can we tell if we're growing or not? The spiritual growth aspect, how do we know when we're growing in our spiritual faith? It's kind of like um, in life, everybody has a backpack. Everybody has to carry our own backpack in life. It's our needs and you're on a hike. How many of you guys have ever been hiking? You go, hike, you're, you go hiking and you have a eight hour hike you better have a backpack and you better have some water, right? You know you have to have some water. You better have some nutrition in there. Everybody has a backpack and everybody has a little um, pack that they carry with them. The Bible teaches us in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fill, fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. But in Galatians chapter 6, verse 5, it says, for each one shall bear his own load. So in Galatians said, everybody needs to bear their own load, but at the same time it says, bear one another's loads. What, what is that all talking about? That means 
we're all on a hike, a journey of life, and we all have our backpack, and we're all going up this terrain, and sometimes it's flat, and sometimes it's steep, and sometimes it has a major incline, and sometimes it's on grass, and sometimes it's on rock. Sometimes we have no problems, and we can just book through it, but there's times in our life we're going to be on a rocky incline, and there's going to be rocks, and sometimes those rocks ahead of us are going to fall down, and they're going to hurt people behind us. And it may be divorce. It may be finances, it may be kids, but any time that rock comes and it hurts the person behind you, they are out of order. And that's when it says, guys, we must carry the loads of others. God is going to give that person that is hurt, that person that that boulder came down and hurt their leg, and that person that no longer can carry their backpack, that is when the birds of the air are landing on the tree and get nourishment. We must carry the load of those at that moment that is hurting. That is unexpected blessing from God. We are spiritually mature when we can see other people's needs and hurts. And we can say at our seed that God has grown up our seed into a tree with branches so the birds can land on the tree. Really, when I planted the mustard tree, I just wanted mustard for my sandwich. But God said, it's not about you. It's about what other people need from you. And if we are going to be who God wants us to be, we must look at our lives. We must look at how small we are, but how great God is and what God truly wants for our life. So can I ask you a couple questions? Are you the one person that God can use to make a change in the world? Or better yet, the change in the world where you are? The world needs change. The world needs change agents. And we're going to change the world. How? By taking our seed, our gifts, our ministry, our finances, our life, and we're going to bury them in the ground? I'm not going to just go do something? No. The way I'm going to be a change agent for this world, for my family, and for my finances, is I'm going to take and give them to God. I'm going to bury it at his feet. Your neighborhood, your family, your workplace, your school, your coaching position, your mission, your support, your passion, and what you embrace. Are you the person that God uses to understand things that may be small, that God can show up and give you impossible solutions to what you think is very improbable. God wants to give you impossible solutions. When you don't know what to do. When you think your life is falling apart. When you don't know what to do, how to pray for it, and what's going on. We need God to show up in a mighty way and we need to give our hearts, our lives to God. The timing will be completely up to God. It's not up to you. Our past is unavailable for us to communicate. It's up to God. We must bury our past, the seeds of doubt, the seeds of failure. Let God let those seeds die. The difference between dead seed and live seed, there's two seeds. There's the orthodox seed that's alive, and there's the unorthodox seed that is dead. There's no life in the unorthodox seed. It sheds its ability to live, but the unorthodox seed, it has life within it. It's the difference between a seed and a piece of sand. You bury a piece of sand, it's gonna be in that, it's never gonna grow. There's no life in a seed of sand, but an unorthodox seed, you let that seed grow. It's going to grow to a powerful point. When we give our hearts, our lives, our past to God, he is either going to forgive it and move on. But what you know is this, we need people that say, I am ready. In this moment to walk forward with God, knowing God will walk with me every step of the way. I am ready to commit my life and my plans to him. Let us begin by lifting our eyes towards heaven and saying, I don't know what I'm going to be doing. I know that my life 
my ministry, even my resources are insignificant, small in the presence of this world. But I know that if I give whatever I have, my life, my ministry, my future, my kids, and my resources to God. And let them be buried. When God shows up and we are men and women of faith, God takes our faith, sprinkles his love and his blessing upon our seed. Supernatural things take place. You know, we just got done with Financial Peace University last Wednesday. And I tell people that if you're struggling financially, you need to go through Financial Peace University. If you're struggling in areas of your life, here's what usually does not work. Lord, I need a million dollars. Lord, I, I'm gonna go play the lottery. Lord, if you give me $5,000, I promise you 4,500 of it, I'll put it in the lottery and, and Lord, your hand will be upon it, you'll bless me and I'll be a multimillionaire so I can go. I wouldn't try that effect. What I would try is get on our knees before God and say, Lord, I have no idea what to do. Either I need to raise more money or I need to spend less money, but what I need to do is I need to give everything to you. Lord, I don't know what to do with my kids. They are goofed up. They are, they are their husband, my husband's sons. I mean, they are totally goofed up. What do I do with them? What am I gonna do about them? Do you just say this, 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 this? And you've done it for so many years, it hasn't worked for the first 18. What you need to do is get on your face before God and say, God, the seed I'm gonna to plant to you. I'm gonna pray over my kids and I need you to water over my kids and I need you to show up in faith and do unexpected blessings because I cannot. I can't do finances. I can't do kids. I can't do relationships. I am goofed up. I'm just a nobody. My life is nothing. My seed is so small. Why do you even look at me? And he said this. The mustard seed, the most small of all seeds, plants it in the ground. God takes that seed of faith, knowing I can't do it, but by faith, God can take anything that I give to him, and supernaturally, it's gonna grow. And it's gonna grow to one of the biggest plants in a tree in the garden, to a point it doesn't just grow it grows and has branches. It's gigantic and then not only grows, but it has opportunity to allow other people to be loved by them because they're doing what God wants them to do. Branches. The enormity of God's blessing upon a nobody's life. And guess what we are? When it all boils down, we are a seed Without God, now it mounts to nothing. You look at the world. We are a individual. Boil down to a person. That in it is no good thing. But when a person has the blessing and the faith of God, God says, your nothing becomes something. We become something when we become part of God's family. When Jesus dies on the cross and we accept him, we become adopted into his family. Something that is nothing, something that has nothing, then becomes everything, not because of who you are, it's because you got God to take over your life and now you're a child of God. You have become something because you gave up something. You gave up your life. You gave up your sin. You accepted Jesus. And when you accept Jesus, by faith, the unexpected takes place. We need to plant our seeds of doubt, of fear, of family, of finances, of relationships. The, de the fears that we have, we need to give them to God and let God 
look at you intently in the heart and say, because of your faith, because of your willingness to sacrifice, because of your ministry, because of your seed, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to supernaturally show up in your life. I'm going to grow you to a point where you will say, how in the world did that happen? How did I get fixed? Two years ago, I was a goof up. A year ago, I was an alcoholic. How in the world did God change that? It's because you allowed the seed of your life into God's hands and he took your seed and he blessed it. He grew it and God showed up. And then when somebody talks to you, how, how did that happen? How did you get out of the scenario that you were in and you could just honestly give God the glory and say, you know what? One day I was in church and I realized my life was a goofed up mess and I just needed to give it to God. And God took my goof ups. He planted them and he blessed them and he supernaturally gave to me the very thing that I didn't even know I needed. But God blessed, God compounded it, God used it. And now that you're asking me, can I tell you how? I have no idea. I know that God showed up and God did the extraordinary in my little ordinary life. And I give him the glory and the honor and the praise. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we do come before you. And Lord, we don't understand how this principle works. How the least becomes the greatest. How little becomes much. How when we give our hearts, our lives, our ministries to you, how you show up by faith and you sprinkle it with your blessing, and it turns out extraordinary. Lord, I pray that as we talk over these next few weeks, talking about how to be men and women rooted in you, seated in you, blessed by you, it all takes a foundation that everything that we do and say has to be given to you so you can do it through us. I pray that our hearts and our lives will be given to you. Where we have failed you, you'll forgive us. We ask you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Thank you for being here today, Pastor Al.